So, as we mentioned earlier, there are numerous challenges facing the healthcare system in the United States, with millions of Americans uninsured and unable to pay for a doctor's visit. Affordable health care is hard to come by. Dr. Ricardo Nuela works at a Texas hospital where cost is second to care. In his new book, he chronicles the lives of five patients who turn to his help after facing financial barriers. And he joins Hari Srinivasan to discuss what America needs to do to fix its health care crisis. Christian, thanks. Dr. Ricardo Nuela, thanks so much for joining us. Um, first, to give our audience a little bit of a background, you're writing this story about a safety net hospital in Houston, Bentow. What is a safety net hospital? Safety net hospital is a hospital that provides health care even if people don't have health insurance. Uh, the safety net hospital that I'm writing about is Ben Taub Hospital. It's part of a system, a healthcare system in Houston, Texas, that provides health care for people who can't access health care or can't afford health care, which is becoming more and more in our society. Again, the safety net hospital is part is, in Houston is a public health care system. This is generated by property taxes to help assure that everybody has health coverage health care in the city. So give us an idea of this scale, the number or the percentage of people who are coming there for care who don't have insurance. Yeah, I mean, in Houston, Houston is one of the highest un, uh, uninsured rates in the country. More than 1 million people are uninsured in Houston. Texas is, one of, is the highest uninsured state in the country, percentage-wise. And that's more than 5 million people. In the United States, that's 40 million people who are uninsured. And remember that we pegged health insurance to employment. So as employment changes, people get laid off, we see more people at the safety net hospital. What's the kind of experience that a young doctor can get at a safety net hospital that they might not be able to at, well, to put it crudely, a fancier one? Yeah, I, I think it's that contact with people. I think it's the ability to feel the responsibility. That's what kept me in the safety net hospital is the feeling of responsibility. We're we're in a in a in, in a crisis of burnout in our in our profession, and a lot of that has to do with the bureaucracy that comes with our healthcare system. But when when that is spread away, and you can just deal with what you are in you're trained to do, which is to sit and think through problems with, with people. I think that that's one of the reasons why people come to the safety net hospital. They also come to see the different pathologies, the different illnesses that manifest in, in, in patients. And that's why a lot of uh, students really want to come to safety net hospitals to learn how to train. It, becomes, it makes them better doctors. So let's talk about some of the things that you are more likely to see than perhaps other places. Um, one of the patients that you describe is a woman named Ebony. And uh, put this in the context of kind of maternal health challenges in the United States or even specifically to uh, black women and what they face. Right. Ebony had a problem, which is that she was bleeding during her pregnancy and that put her at high risk. She had moved from a state, California, where she had Medicaid or, or health insurance provided by the state, but she moved to Texas where she was uninsured. And so when the bleeding started, she, she was shuttled between emergency rooms until she found the safety net hospital. The placenta was blocking the birth canal, which meant that it could not be born without causing a catastrophic bleed. Doctors at that moment offered her a medical abortion to, uh, that would be the best way to ensure that Ebony's life was saved. So if she came to you with the same symptoms today in Texas, what would she be facing given how the political landscape has changed? What she would be facing is the, you know, having to risk her own life for that, for the, for that birth. Uh, and, and not even the choice. That's, that's the thing. Ebony selected to proceed with the pregnancy, but this happens and many women don't want to risk their lives. And, and that's, in my mind, that's their liberty. But in, in Texas now, it's, it's very confusing for doctors on what advice to give patients like these. 
Is it harder now in Texas for a doctor at a hospital or a doctor anywhere to have an honest conversation with a woman about her health care for fear of being sued by a third party if the word abortion enters the conversation? Un undoubtedly. Now, I'm not an obstetrician. My dad is an obstetrician, and my colleagues are obstetricians, and I've spoken with some of them about this. But one of the things that sets safety net hospitals apart, one of the things that we strive for is those that transparency and that conversation and that knowledge that we're going to be trying to help the person make the best decision for their own lives. And, and that has changed now because of the abortion laws in Texas. I mean, you talk about one of the patients that you call Geronimo, and mm -hmm. he had needs for uh, a liver transplant, right? And yeah. tell us a little bit about him. What happened? Well, Jeronimo was a gas station attendant who he had liver disease that was uh, that had gotten to the point where he was very ill, and he made too much. He he qualified for Medicaid, but when he started to get his disability payment, it put him over the. He wasn't poor enough for Medicaid, and so it was taken away from him. That was right at the moment where he needed a liver transplant to survive. The safety net system does not have transplant capabilities. The infrastructure that's needed to build transplant centers and to have the, the, the personnel, so much high investment that you know a safety net system really has to be utilitarian with these funds and, 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 and transplants is just not something that it can afford. So you know one of our, one of our goals was to try to see if he could qualify for this insurance because in America, in order to get a transplant, you do need insurance by and large. There's also an entire demographic that you probably see more at this hospital in Houston than perhaps a lot of other hospitals, even safety net hospitals in other parts of the country, which are undocumented people. Yes. And you you wrote about Roxanne, uh, an undocumented woman from El Salvador um, who had complications from a cancer-related illness, and she needed amputations. And it's just startling that something like that could well slip through the existing cracks and get to you. Tell us a little bit about her. Well, it's it's an example of how broken our system is that uh, we, we don't have these standards for dignity for patients. Roxana came to the safety net hospital because she had suffered a great complication during a life-saving surgery. Now, I want, I want to make this clear. The life-saving surgery that she had was a moonshot. It was an incredible manifestation of the American healthcare system. It showed our ambitions. It showed that we have surgeons capable of doing amazing things. We just can't complete the job and give people chronic care. So that when in the hospital, when she changed from an emergency patient to a chronic care patient, she was dis discharged out into her apartment with gangrenous arms and legs. And there was no plan for how to deal with her. Thankfully, she lived in a city like Houston where she could go to the public health care system that is funded by property taxes from members of the community, and she could get those amputations and the care that she needed. So you're in a state with conservative values, and you've got a legal climate, which creates other challenges for you. But you're also saying that this hospital can be a model for the rest of the country to still have these conservative values and show compassionate care. Explain how. What's plagued us in America is trying to bring these two big concepts together, and they're represented by different political sides. I think we want to get costs under control, and we want to provide health care for everybody in this country. But because it's so expensive, it's very difficult to provide for everybody. What, what I've found in the system where I work in is that, that these conservative values of cost cutting have come together with, with the more liberal values of providing to everybody, regardless of citizenship or um, insurance status. And I think that one of the reasons that that's happened is because there's been conversations in order to make this system work. And that's what we really need to look for in, in, in designing a healthcare system is, is that everybody needs to weigh in. We have to look at our 
similarities. Seven out of 10 Texans believe that the federal government has a role in providing basic health insurance to everybody in the country. I mean, think about that. That means that across the political spectrum, there's agreement. We just have to focus on that agreement. And what I am really proud of is that I worked in a system where we found those political ways through those political ideologies. Well, one of the other things that's interesting in the book is um, how Ben Taub, the hospital, is able to cost about half the national average per patient, but at the same time, you're the fastest in the country for figuring out whether somebody is having a heart attack or not. So how can you keep the costs where they are and still have a level of expertise that the rest of the country hasn't got yet? I think that is the philosophy of quality improvement and making sure that the healthcare goes to what's needed, okay? There's, there's just not waste in the system like there is waste in the private healthcare system. Since it's evidence-based medicine, and since we are not performing more healthcare than is necessary, then we can focus on emergencies like heart attacks, strokes, trauma, and build great protocols to identify those and to take care of those in a timely manner. You know, if you think on the other side, you know, those, the, the resources are used for other things that are not as essential and vital for those things. And, and, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we can demonstrate quality while also cutting costs. Give me an idea of sort of what's the cost difference here on what either you're spending per patient or how do you quantify the level of efficiency that the safety net hospital has? Yeah, that's a great question. And so there's ways to look at how much Medicare is paying per patient per year. For instance, this year, it was $15,000 uh, per patient per year that Medicare is paying. Private insurance uh, pays less, but only because Medicare is, is for patients that are 65 and older who usually utilize health services more. So if you if you take apples and apples, Private insurance is actually paying more, but at, at our health system, you can you can look and see what the overall budget is and how many people are are, are in the system, and it's it's far less. It's less. It's thirty percent of the total cost. And one of the things that I do in my book is follow a patient and the the medical bill that he incurs in our public healthcare system, where there is that that profit motive. One of the patients who had treatment for tonsil cancer that involved x-ray therapy, surgeries, admissions. His total bill was what he calls it less than a pickup truck, $40,000, which is for people who have been in the healthcare system, they know how little that is compared to the equivalent in the private system where there's a profit motive. You know, I also wonder if there is a hesitation on the parts of now doctors especially in a state like Texas, to come out and speak like you are. You're talking about the difficult climate, about having reproductive health conversations with women. You're talking about sort of compassionate care for undocumented. Um, you're talking about universalized health care. And I wonder if there is a concern that even having these conversations, being out front, puts a bullseye on your back. I feel hopeful in my system because for instance, I feel that the local government is supportive of this safety net healthcare system. But you're right that it there's there's it's because it is a public healthcare system, it is subject to the politics of what's going on locally. I think that you know, we're also arriving at a crux right here, which is that Physician burnout is occurring, and it's a big problem for the United States. If you think about how much society pours into doctors studying what they do and, and performing all the acts what they do, and that my colleagues, many of them, are leaving the profession early, uh, it just means that we're going to have less doctors with more health care that's needed for this country. So we've hit a point where we need to think about that we're spending so much money on health care. It's a problem that 
we've just kicked the we've just kicked the can down the road since 1910s, and now what what it's what's happened is is that the profession itself is people are leaving it and not wanting to go into it, and so that's one of the reasons why I think people like me are speaking up about it because we're genuinely concerned about that experience that patients have with the healthcare system, and also that our colleagues are are, are leaving the profession early. You are from El Salvador. You came from a family that's three generations of doctors. And you also write about your uh, grandmother who came to you for advice, uh, medical advice. Um, tell us what happened. Yeah, my, my grandmother from El Salvador came, and when I was a, uh, a younger doctor, she had this problem where she couldn't swallow very well. And I uh, I just went through what the algorithm on how to deal with that, you know, and when the algorithm, sh she got a test and it was a normal test, I, I, I just chalked it up to, okay, your symptom, I don't know what your symptom is due to. And later I found out that uh, she got another test when she went back to El Salvador that showed that she had esophageal cancer. And it just showed me that I had been subject to something that I call algorithmania, which is that the over-reliance on algorithms. I had stopped thinking about the symptom, stopped thinking about the person of my grandmother the moment that that test came back. And what I wish that I had done was followed that symptom and said, okay, this test was negative. What do you still have symptoms? What else can we do to figure this out? What ended up happening was is that it 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 led to a spiral really where she ended up getting an unnecessary surgery in El Salvador and and she I think she suffered greatly from that. I think she she could have been diagnosed in a more precise manner and uh I I still it still weighs on me today. What do you want people to take away from this book? I want them to take away that there we can come together to solve this healthcare crisis. This healthcare crisis manifests in so many ways that we don't think about, that's hidden from us, and that affects real people's lives. And we'll, But we can solve this problem if we just think about what we aim for, which is we need to decrease costs and we need to give healthcare access to everybody. There's strength in numbers. And if we can bind, bind together and think about building a healthcare system rather than just patching one up, which is what we've done since the early 1900s, then I think that we can actually solve this problem. The book is called The People's Hospital, Dr. and author Ricardo Nuila. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.